well, exhausted at this hour. I mean, all right, we are, uh, we are streaming live on Facebook. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Joe. Um, good morning. Uh, welcome to this week at CPUSA.org. Uh, we're joined this morning by John Case, who is a retired uh, software developer and union organizer uh, out of West Virginia and also uh, the host, a uh, longtime host of a uh, blog on socialist economics, and also by Dale Matthews, who is a researcher at the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, this morning's discussion is part of our uh, overarching discussion this month on um, the environment, the ecological crisis, class struggle, and socialism. And the, the theme we were sort of going to delve into is um, the notion of, of economic planning, uh, planned economy, um, and what that might mean in, um, you know, as we as we address uh, both the environmental crisis and the the numerous uh, crises facing the working class, uh, you know, wealth inequality, the destruction of, of public services, the the lack of income, um, and so forth. Uh, so just to uh, start us off. You know, a few of the, the contributions that people have sent in uh, to this month's discussion on our site have focused on this, this idea of, uh, of planning. Um, so uh, Lowell Denny, a, a comrade in Hawaii, um, talked about the need to uh, present the Green New Deal as a way of developing whole new sectors of the economy and, and the kind of jobs that will be created uh, in those. Um, Jake Benecke, who works in, in fishery science, uh, uh, talked about the, the notion of the, the best available science and what that means in resource management, like uh, how we divvy out uh, access to resources um, for competing needs, um, uh, and the need to do that in a way that is, is uh, both scientifically based and ethical. And finally, a, a forthcoming contribution um, talks about the need for a, an international approach to addressing the uh, ecological crisis, to, um, sort of uh, to address the, the difference in consumption between um, nations facing imperialist domination, so nations in the developing world and uh, the um, imperialist powers. So the, the need to secure resources so that um, developing countries can continue to develop uh, uh, and, and what that might mean for um, uh, the economies of the first world. So um, market economy versus planned economy, what, what is that, what's the state of the debate on that? Like what, what, what do those terms mean in, in current parlance? You're asking our guests? I'm asking, I'm asking all, all of you, Joe and uh, John and Dale. Um, so whoever wants to chime in. What's the question again? Uh, so when we think about uh, market economy versus planned economy, um, what is the current understanding of, of those terms? How do people use them in um, sort of uh, scientific writing on, on economics right now? Well, I don't well, think that uh, they, uh, I'll go first. Anybody else want yeah. to go first? No, go ahead. Uh, I mean, every economy that I know of, in real life is has planned and market features um <clears throat> you know the uh i mean warfare is almost always planned mm -hmm. and uh you know healthcare systems in a lot of countries is planned uh both in the you know officially social officially self-described socialist and and uh social democratic in other states including the united states there's Definitely planned aspects. Medicare is a uh, is a uh, public is is legislated as a public good. <clears throat> so, um, in, in part, it's a question of degree. If you're speaking in just economic terms, um, I mean, what how much is market and how much is planned? Uh, I mean, I think fundamentally, you know, that the the scarcity ultimately. <laughs> boundary and a determination on, on how far, how much you can plan. 
I mean, if you have a shortage of goods that people want, then you either have to distribute them. You, you can do a market allocation. In other words, put a price on them and allocate them by price. Or you can form a line and the people at the end of the line don't get it, don't get any, uh, whoever that is. All right. So there's a queue and then there's a market. I mean, if you have a shortage. So scarcity ultimately, you know, is going to affect, you know, how much um, is public. The public part has to be planned. I mean, and, and planned presumably as a uh, in the public interest. Um, so I think that's a historical question. I think Marx approached that question, you know, as a materialistic uh, matter. I mean, partly that's going to be determined by your level of development. I mean, what you can produce, how, how much surplus you have to distribute, um, okay. et cetera, et cetera. That's my so, uh, initial answer. Thank you. Uh, Dale. Um... Yeah, I agree with John on it being a question of degree. Uh, a lot of times in academia, we get involved in this uh, study of sort of ideal types, you know, the free market versus planned. And the reality of the thing is you don't have in the real world these concrete examples of these ideal types. You Everything is a, is a mix. You have a mix of planning with uh, market in just about every economy in the world. Um, even at the level of discourse, political discourse in the states, um, you hear Republicans uh, and other conservatives, you know, saying that uh, we should not choose winners. Um, you know, industrial policy needs to go out the window. That's too much government. You know, it's uh, free market should reign supreme and all of this nonsense. But, uh, you know, what, what about NASA? <laughs> you know, the, the whole uh, push to reach the moon after the Russians supposedly beat us at the first, you know, beat us out the gate. You know, that was industrial uh, uh, policy. It was big government. And uh, it's what made, uh, if Trump wants to go back to what made America great, you know, there's a perfect example. <laughs> and, you know, this is, this is interesting, that this idea that, that, you know, there's always a mix. Um, that, you know, we can't deal with them as abstractions. I wonder if we could even go like, to the point of saying that, that to a degree, even markets are, are planned. Uh, part of my uh, doctoral work looked at um, the the sort of uh, commercial revolution in in medieval Europe and the setting up markets, like getting people to behave in certain ways, to uh, engage in in commerce in certain places. That was a those involved like a, a huge degree of of planning by the the governments of the time, and I suspect the same is is true today. Like we talk about, you can distribute things by price. But um, even the, 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 the pricing schemes for a lot of commodities are also determined, or at least uh, partially determined by, by public policy. So when the, the government subsidizes you know, a, a renewable energy um, startup, that's, you know, it, it has, it's a market mechanism that's, that's planned, right? Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. No, I was asking uh, if either you or John ag agreed with Scott's contention that market mechanisms are also planned. Well, they're all bounded by law. I mean, they're all part of laws and they're part of property law, right? I mean, mm -hmm. but it can be very different. For example, in China, there's no, uh, there's no private, there's no, that's not entirely true, but there, it, there's no basic private property law that's an assumption of Chinese jurisprudence. And uh, one of the very difficult problems they had in the, when they were uh, abandoning Mao's uh, theory, so to speak, um, and uh, moving and, and trying to start this engine of development one of the problems they had was, was that how, if people had savings or profits, uh, how could they put them in a bank and not believe that the leadership would, uh, the political leadership would politicize everything and you know, take their money? So why would they put it in there, right? So the, the government made a, a, a pretty interesting commitment that uh, they would, the accounts in the banks would remain anonymous and they would uh, attach a state tax across the board, regardless of account. Okay, 
um, but that they you the the money that the monies and the funds and there was a limited amount of paper that was legally money, but they would be put there and preserved, and the government honored that, you know, so people could have a place to put their quote property in effect because really being able to store the value that you earn is the key to accumulation of capital, whether you call it private property or not. And um, so that these mechanisms, the Chinese, and they used Mao's uh, old commune system as the foundation of city and town and region owned enterprises, right? They were publicly owned, privately run, and actually privately run for profit as well. So it's, <clears throat> I think that, and that's part of Chinese history. Our history over here, you know, is very, is uh, very different. And, uh, and we have a very different history. We, we've come through a whole, I mean, it's very difficult to take models from China, for example, and say, oh, wow, well, gee, it's working over there. They have a substantially greater amount of uh, direction of the economic uh, system. They have a lot of levers on the economy. Um, they have better ability to move money around where it's really needed in an emergency, actually. Um, but for us to get to a situation where we, the, the, the ruling class or the ruling government had the ability to, you know, do that, it, it's, you got a substantial uh, difference in uh, direction you have to go, right? I mean, so th there is a revolution between those two poles, even though they are economically speaking matters of degree, but politically they are, they are chasms apart. So what you're saying is that the issue is not so much planning as such, but the degree to which the economy is either privately uh, owned or publicly owned is- At least directed, you know. I mean, I think to go back to Lenin's theory of the uh, commanding heights, I mean, it's a, it's a very logical and appropriate theory. And if, if you want to have a public sector that is going to have enough economic strength and muscle, okay, and control uh, to keep it from going to hell, but it cannot replace capitalism's role in economic development when you have a backward economy. Uh, you gotta have you. You will not find a substitute to market for markets. That's one of the lessons of the USSR's failure, by the way. You know, okay, you, you have to get and what Doug found backward. and what's that, Joe? Genius. I said the United States is not economically backwards. Uh, so it, no. it's an advanced economy. And so uh, what gives um, in a situation, uh, Dale, that economically obtains in an advanced country like the United States? Yeah, actually, I'd like to go back to what you said earlier, Joe. You are correct. Um, it's a question of who does the planning. Usually when it's... Uh, uh, a planned economy is uh, dissed in the United States. They usually mean uh, no government planning. In other words, the planning is actually taken out of the hands of government and put in the hands of the 1%. So it's a question of who does the planning. I mean, planning has existed back in the stone, stone ages, even as Michael Hudson said in, a, in an interview, you have to plan when to plant crops, when to harvest them, how much seed you're going to use, and, and things like that. So it's, uh, you know, planning has always been with us. And so as, if we look um, uh, concretely at, um, you know, what, what's, uh, what's necessary right now to preserve um, a planet that's, that's livable um, and an economy that can grow sustainably, what are the, you know, what are the main, uh, what are the main focuses? What has to be brought under more uh, public control? And um, I think everything control. does. The we have to go. We should go back to the whole concept of a commons. The concept of a commons has been edged out in favor of private initiative, private ownership. And this is something that needs to be, especially now with the dwindling resources, the growing population, you know, you're squeezing people into smaller and smaller uh, places, uh, unsustainable places on the planet um, in favor of uh, the rights, so-called rights of a very tiny elite. 
that now pretends to own everything. We need to go back to the concept of a commons. Um, could you uh, elaborate on the, um, maybe, uh, maybe uh, John, uh, on, on this, this notion of the commons? Well, I think the, 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 the energy industry has to become part of the commons. If we're thinking about a Green New Deal, for example, I mean, the, there's no way that Exxon and the, uh, you know, the, the major energy companies, uh, as they're currently organized and governed, um, there's no way that they're going to not wage just all out war against any attempt to, uh, you know, redirect their resources and, and do the things that have to be done. So uh, at, at the very least, the commons is going to have to include some control over energy resources. And I think that, that you know, that's one of the things that's scaring everybody in some senses, because everybody, I think, knows if they look back at the last hundred years of U.S. history, the power of these energy corporations is immense. And, uh, you know, you'd be careful about shooting at the king and missing. <laughs> brothers and sisters. Uh, <clears throat> the... Um, so that's one healthcare. I mean, I don't believe, I think Bernie is correct. Okay. I mean, but my wife thinks I might be wrong <laughs> anyway, but, but I think Bernie is correct. That it's not really going to be possible to universalize healthcare and reduce costs without a state takeover mm -hmm. uh, the insur of the health insurance. But you got to keep in mind that that's about a third of us capital. The third biggest, excuse me, third biggest re concentration of U.S. It's immense. We're and talking it's, about it's trillions of dollars. A fraction of the, fraction of the economy. So, it, six. Yeah. So, I mean, and those folks are not going to take kindly to their property being confiscated. Okay. Uh, maybe without uh, compensation. So, um, in effect, in, 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 they, they, they see these things strategically, too. Nonetheless, I don't think there's a way to get it done without, you know, taking some of that wealth. Okay. So, and I think the people... It's a question of how they come to that conclusion. Usually people don't come to this conclusion theoretically. They come to this conclusion when everything falls the hell apart and crashes on the ground. And they say, what do we do now? But there's only one, there was never, all, there was always only one thing to be done. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's where the commons needs to, you know, think about it strategically, yeah, there you go. I mean, energy and healthcare, how does that happen? Um, is a big so question we're gonna vote on. Joe, you you've argued that that we're in a, a socialist moment. Um, is are people starting to come to that conclusion uh, in a mass way about about energy and, and healthcare in particular? Well, you know, I think that people uh, are understanding, you know, socialism based on the real conditions that they are forced to confront uh, every day, and so. When they think about socialism, they think about the need for uh, public health, you know, as John was, was just saying. Um, or when they uh, think about, you know, socialism, they think about the need for perhaps uh, uh, public works uh, jobs, you know, uh, even though the unemployment rate is uh, low, um, of course, people are having to work two or three jobs. You know, they they see a need for uh, the fight for 15 and a minimum wage and the need for an, an industrial an infrastructure policy that would uh, uh, make that uh, compensate, you know, for that. So um, uh, to that extent, I, I think that, you know, there's a growing interest in uh, socialism. We shouldn't misinterpret the idea to uh, I uh, think that the uh, old model of socialism as it was conceived in the Soviet Union is now suddenly gripped by a majority of the working class. That, that's not the case. Uh, but I do think that people are gravitating in, in a, that direction. Uh, but when it comes to the economy, Dale, I wonder, um, uh, you know, if uh, uh, in your opinion, uh, when you say the uh, commons, are you arguing that uh, each and every section of the economy now has to be publicly owned and operated? Is, is that your view? Um, I haven't really 
given it um, much thought, I don't think that each section of the economy can be. Um, I would have to mull over it a little bit more, but um, we could perhaps uh, get back on that on a future date. I think perhaps we could um, center the discussion around this woman who won the Nobel Prize in 2009, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, gave up eight principles for managing a commons. Um, this kind of idea, uh, the fact that it got a Nobel Prize puts it kind of in the mainstream. Um, and there, even the 1% is, I think, looking at ways to hijack this for their favor which is probably why it uh, would be a wise idea to look at them. Just briefly, the eight principles for managing a commons um, she, that she gave were define clear group boundaries, one, match rules governing use of common goods to local needs and conditions, two, ensure that those affected by the rules can participate in modifying the rules, that's three, make sure the rulemaking rights of community members are respected by outside authorities, that's four, develop a system carried out by community members for monitoring members' behavior, that's five, use graduated sanctions for rule violators, that's six, seven, provide accessible low-cost means for dispute res resolution, that's seven, and the last one is build responsibility for governing the common resources and nested tiers from the lowest level up to the entire interconnected system. Um, these are actually eight um, principles that are worth uh, sort of looking, taking a closer look at. And um, I would even be willing to take part in a discussion on them uh, if I have time to sort of delve into in more detail, look, review what she, she wrote about these eight principles. Okay. Um, so we're approaching our um, uh, the end of our time here. Um, I wonder if we could just um, at the uh, uh, briefly address this idea of the international disparity in access to resources, um, the effect of imperialism, and how we uh, take that into account um, in in addressing ecological crisis. So, um, uh, for example. Um, uh, a, if we, if we, um, for example, taxed uh, carbon dioxide emissions, that would have a very uh, disparate impact on India and on the United States, for example. Um, how do we, uh, how do we address that inter internationally? What are the, uh, John? Well, um, I think you got to follow up. With the pay the losers uh, wherever you are. And uh, in other words, there's a lot of shifts and changes that are going to require people to uh, change their way of life. Um, and uh, we see it, I mean, West Virginia, here's a perfect example of, you don't have to go, you know, even to other countries um, <clears throat> where, um, um, you know, achieving a, uh, a balance in the, the aspirations for people of the American people for more equity and for uh, less aggravated inequality with also what, what would constitute equal and uh, relations with other countries, especially developing countries. And since everybody is now enmeshed in this global market, I, I would say in a sense, the age of imperialism is been surpassed in some ways because it basically imperialism won in, in the sense of capitalism spreading all over the world everywhere into every nook and cranny of everything just as marx predicted actually you know um so i mean i think that uh you, you, when you're talking about uh you know how to handle global inequality it, it's not fundamentally different you know than 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 national inequality in the country, especially as it's been developing. And um, the empowerment of the, uh, 
you know, the world's people. Like, for example, if a if a, Danny Roderick is a very important international economist, and he uh, he argues uh, pretty effectively that the big pro issue is you have to strengthen the standing of institutional players that are very important, like around the labor or the economy, in the uh, economic negotiation process. For example, if there was a global labor organization that had that standing at the UN that could then assign a player who would have to sign off on, on trade agreements, okay, as, as, as it either making progress toward or meeting, you know, uh, standards that would be, reflect the interests, especially of workers on both sides of, you know, whatever borders we're talking about. So, I mean, this, it, uh, but that whole movement uh, toward uh, more internationalism, you know, in response to globalization and more global institutions to manage this uh, ju this immense thing, um, I think that's the only ultimate way to go. I'm not sure how we get there. I think you gotta. I always figure that um, if you, you know, in the in the trade disputes, if you focus on you know, uh, the, the gain, how are the gains from trade that the United States is getting, how are they being distributed in our country? Because that same question is on the other side of the table for other countries that are trading with the United States or trading with other countries in order to obtain some comparative advantage based on something they do better. That's the theory. Well, it all, all the theory has a, has a back end cycle, which says, okay, you, you made some gains. Your country made some money off of the deal you made with the United States. Well, who got it? Yeah. Right? Who got the money? And, how, and was it reinvested in the country or was it just extracted? Okay. And the same question. So I think if you focus on setting the example, well, in our country, uh, we're going to distribute the gains of trade, kind of like both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are saying. Uh, we're going to distribute the gains from trade, you know, back either through transaction taxes or, you know, high rates of, of tax on them uh, back to the people. And, if, you know, if we set that example, then the same, you know, becomes that then, then the possibility of a global standard of doing likewise, I think, becomes so, possible. So, so the, the, the argument then is basically that the, um, uh, the, the working class of the United States is in a, in a position that has a, a, a common interest with um, workers in, uh, and, and people uh, in uh, uh, nations under imperialist domination elsewhere in the world, which is, again, a, a sort of fundamental part of, of you know, our idea of working class internationalism. But uh, Dale, yeah. uh, your thoughts, oh, sorry, before we... Listen, Scott, I'm gonna have to cut out because I've got a student here who just came to take an exam. <laughs> um, Sorry. I could probably give maybe a word or two. What was it that you? Um, so uh, on, on addressing the um, sort of the effect of imperialism um, as we try to manage the ecological crisis, uh, the disparity between um, the advanced capitalist world and, and developing nations. Wow. Um, huh. <laughs> we can also uh, save it for another time if you prefer. We might have to save it for another time. Yeah, That's I think you. so. Thank you, Dale. Sure. Thank you, John Case. We invite everybody you, to check out uh, this discussion on our website, Scott, um, at the cpusa.org. Uh, how can people con contribute? Uh, people can uh, send a, a message to discussion at cpusa.org uh, for publication. Um, if you go to our webpage, um, there's a, a big heading in the slider, uh, class struggle, ecological crisis and socialism with a button says, that says join the discussion. Click there, you'll see a, a list of um, sort of a, a guiding question, some articles from our archives to sort of orient things and then uh, contributions that folks have sent in. Uh, also uh, on Sunday, um, there will be at 7 p.m. A, a webinar, this is a webinar on Harper D3 strategy. Um, if you haven't registered for that yet, uh, please do so. And, and we hope to see you there. Um, thanks for watching and we will see you uh, next week. All right, and John and Dale, I wanna invite you to, to come back. Thank you for coming. John, I'd like in, in particular to debate this issue about imperialism being surpassed. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a hot topic.
And uh, Bob, but the question that Scott uh, that uh, Scott posed, you know, Tapo and, and Becky also argues that global inequality is is has grown to such a degree that the only way that it can be accomplished is internationally uh, in, in a global sense, and yet the institutions for doing so uh, are now coming under attack in particular by the Trump administration. So how to grapple, how to solve that issue concretely is a big question, but for another time, thank you. We'll see everybody next week, same time, same station. <laughs> um, have a good one. Take care, everybody. Later. Thanks, Jerry. Bye-bye.